Well, let's look at the physiology of bilirubin. And there's various parts to this story. In the top left of the abdomen, we have the spleen. In the top right of the abdomen, we have the liver. Coming from the liver, as you probably know, we have the bile ducts, the gallbladder, and going down, the bile ducts are going to join up with the pancreatic duct. And together, these ducts are going to go into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. So we have the hepatic ducts, the common hepatic duct, the cystic duct, the gallbladder, common bile duct, and the pancreas actually is around here like this. This would be the pancreas itself with a pancreatic duct running through to collect the digestive enzymes. And this common bit at the end is the uh, hepatopancreatic ampulla, and there's a sphincter, the hepatopancreatic sphincter, formerly called the sphincter of Oddi. And the small intestine carries on, judginum, ileum, and then eventually it becomes the large intestine. So here we have a stretch of large intestine. Ending, of course, in the rectum and the anus. And the other part we're going to need to do this, tell this story is the, uh, the kidney. Or one kidney of two. Now, you probably know that the red cells are produced in the red bone marrow. Now, when they're in the red bone marrow, they have a nucleus. But when they're released into the circulatory system, they have no nucleus. They're famous for being cells without nuclei. So this means that gradually they get worn out and the plasma membrane, which has got to squeeze through small capillaries in the spleen and the brain and the kidneys. You know, some of these capillaries are so small that the red cells have to deform to get through. And the, uh, the plasma membranes get old and they, uh, they, they rupture over time. And also when cells pass through the spleen, there's specialized cells in the spleen called uh, macrophages. Macrophages in the spleen. Macrophages, of course, derive from monocytes in the blood. And these are fixed macrophages in the spleen. There's also some in the liver, actually, and there's also some in the red bone marrow. And these macrophages form the monocyte macrophage system, what used to be called the reticular endothelial system. And what they do is they take worn out red cells and they take broken up fragments of red cells. So there's a red cell that's broken in half, look. And what the macrophages will do is they will phagocytose them. They'll ingest and digest and break them down to break down products. Now, one thing that is released is a uh, globin. Another thing that's released is heme. <clears throat> and I think you can see that this is the constituents of hemoglobin. So the proteins and the fats and the carbohydrates in the not in that, that's the macrophage. In the red cell, the macrophage will break those down and digest those quite readily. So that will release things like uh, amino acids, fatty acids and um, things that are useful, the breakdown products. And the globin also is, is broken down quite readily into amino acids. Useful, you can use it as part of the protein metabolism. But the heme um, is more difficult to break down. But the iron that was in the heme, there is iron in heme, that's reabsorbed quite effectively actually. The body can reutilize the iron. Um, eventually it will go back to the bone marrow and form the next generation of red blood cells, so that's brilliant. 
But what's left of the heme part when the iron is removed and after the macrophages are finished breaking down the old erythrocytes, what's left is bilirubin. So that's the breakdown product of the heme. And bilirubin is yellow. It's a nice yellow coloured pigment. So remember, bilirubin is yellow. Now the bilirubin is not water soluble. So to be transported in the blood, it must combine with albumin. And that will transport it to the liver. So now we have bilirubin in the liver. Now the, the liver can't go on accumulating bilirubin, it's gonna to need to get rid of it. So to get rid of it, it needs to make it water soluble so it can be excreted in the bile. But it's not water soluble. So we have to make it water soluble. So what the liver does is it combines it with glucuronic glucuronic acid combines it with glucuronic acid and this process is called conjugated conjugation so conjugation is the process of joining look like marriage is a con conjugation isn't it it's a, a joining so the bilirubin joins with the glucuronic acid and the key thing about that is it makes it water soluble. So it can go into the bile ducts. Now remember the bilirubin was yellow. That's true, it is. But bile, of course, is a green color. <clears throat> if you work on surgical wards, you see plenty of bile or even you might have vomited yourself and uh, once the stomach's empty, you can get regurgitation of bile because this is just the duodenum here, where the, uh, the pancreatic and the bile ducts drain their products into. So there can be regurgitation. So the bile is green. You can, as we say, you can see it in vomit. It's very unpleasant. The old fashioned name for that is gall. It's very bitter and not very pleasant vomiting at all. But it's, it's green and, and when it's green, it's, it's called um, Billy Verdin. Verdant is green. What actually happens is it's oxidized in the bile ducts. So in fairly reduced form, the bilirubin is yellow. When it goes into the bile ducts, it's oxidized and that makes it go green. Now, when fatty food arrives in the duodenum, that's going to stimulate the gallbladder and then the bile is going to go down and into the small intestine into the duodenum and there it will emulsify fats so the fat comes in in big oily lumps and the bile breaks it down into millions of little globules like that milk is white because it's a fatty emulsion and that's good because it means that the pancreatic lipase from the pancreas is able to get in between all those globules with a large surface area and it's the lipase that digests the fat so the bile is emulsifying the fat, but the lipase digests it. So this means, of course, now we've got a bilirubin in the intestine. Or biliverdin, <clears throat> it's that similar molecule because it's got there from the bile ducts. And it's fascinating, of course, that it's a waste excretory product in a sense but this is a vital physiological function to emulsify fats, to facilitate the digestion of fatty material. Now, in the small intestine, you have huge numbers of commensal flora, lots and lots of bacteria, untold billions of them. Apparently, uh, feces is a third dry weight bacteria, so there's huge amounts of bacteria. And the bacteria act on the bilirubin that is, of course, in the lumen of the gut. And this is now the lumen of the colon. And the bacteria convert it to urobilinogen.
urobilinogen. So now we have urobilinogen in the lumen of the large intestine especially. Interestingly, urobilinogen is not coloured. It's a, it's a colourless agent or chemical. But when this stays in the intestine, it is partly oxidised. And when it's oxidised, it becomes stercobilin. So the urobilinogen combines with the oxygen to form stercobilin. And stercobilin is what gives the stools their dark brown colour. So it's the urobilinogen oxidised in the lumen of the gut, forming stercobilin, giving the stools their dark brown colour. And in situations where there's, the bile is not getting into the small intestine, therefore the bilirubin is not present, therefore the bacteria can't break it down to urobilinogen, then you're not going to get the stercobilin, so the stools are very pale coloured, which of course is an important clinical observation. So the urobilinogen, some of it stays in the lumen of the gut, but some of it is reabsorbed back into the blood. And again, in the blood, it will be oxidized and the urobilinogen in the blood will be converted to something called, when it's oxidized, urobilin. Urobilin. So two fates for the urobilinogen. It can be converted into stercobilin to colour and partly deodorise the faeces, or it can be reabsorbed as urobilin. And the urobilin is, is yellow again. <clears throat> so interesting, um, one breakdown product if it stays in the lumen of the gut is, is dark brown. This will be dark brown here, the stool. But um, if it's reabsorbed into the blood, the urobilin, it becomes yellow again. So even though the urobilinogen is not coloured itself, it's got the potential to become dark brown or the potential to become yellow if it goes back into the blood. Now the urobilin is taken out by the kidneys and it's incorporated, incorporated into urine and that's what gives urine its characteristic yellow colour. Sometimes it's called urochrome. It colours the urine. Now, because this is happening at a fairly constant rate, it means that the amount of urobilin going into the urine is fairly constant, a fairly constant rate per day. It's about, I think it's about four milligrams a day. So this is good for us as healthcare professionals because if the urine's dark coloured, then the patient's got relatively less water. So we want light straw coloured urine indicating that the urobilin and all the other agents in urine are well diluted. So red cells, bone marrow circulation, monocyte macrophage system, broken down globin and heme. The iron is recovered, the heme becomes bilirubin, carried to the liver, conjugated with glucuronic acid, excreted through the bile ducts, Emulsifies fats, bilirubin acted on by the commensal bacteria becomes urobilinogen. The urobilin urobilinogen that stays in the lumen of the gut is uh, becomes stercobilin, colouring the faeces. The component that is reabsorbed becomes, when it's oxidised, uro, so that's when it's oxidised, becomes urobilin and is excreted in the, in the kidneys. And of course, uh, this is very important physiology to understand when we want to look at jaundice in the, in the next video. But that's the basic physiology we need to know about the bilirubin, biliverdin story.